What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Long Game Podcast, hosted by Thomas Kopelman and Jacob Turner. In each episode, you'll hear us break down financial topics that are relevant to you and your situation. Our goal is to help bring credible financial information to you in short, bite-sized episodes. All opinions expressed on this show are for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on the Long Game Podcast should be considered advice. Always consult with your team of professionals before making any decisions regarding your finances. Right. Hello and welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Long Game Podcast. I'm your co-host, Thomas Kobelman, here with me, Jacob Turner. And today we kind of have a follow-up from the last episode. So <clears throat> I think the average person kind of just knows like, hey, I go invest my dollars. They don't even really know what asset allocation was. So if you didn't listen last week, we really dove into asset allocation, the importance of understanding how you're investing and what asset classes, how your life situation, owning a business, real estate, et cetera, might change your asset allocation. But we wanted to follow this up with part two, which is really on asset location. Obviously, super confusing. There's like two letters difference in both the names, but asset allocation is all about what you own, what you invest in, and asset location is all about where you hold those investments. And so there's really like three types of investment accounts, right? So we have tax deferred. A tax deferred account is your 401k, your IRA, really any account where you put money in that reduces your taxable income, that money grows tax deferred, and then you're going to pay income taxes when you pull it out. Then we have Roth accounts. So Roth accounts are tax-free accounts. You really have Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, technically some permanent life insurance. HSAs really fall into that bucket, even though they're kind of a hybrid. And in Roth accounts, that money you put in post-tax. So you're paying taxes on those dollars, hits your bank account, you're putting that money into the Roth accounts, they grow tax-free, they can be used tax-free. And then the last one is regular taxable accounts. So this is regular brokerage account, this, you know, your ESPP plan where your RSUs go, this can be your cash accounts. Really all those accounts are, is they're taxable, right? So you pay taxes, either income taxes, capital gains taxes, et cetera, based on what happens in that year. I'm going to take a pause there, Jacob. I'm going to let you kind of take this the next step further. Yeah, we talk a lot about the different types of accounts and the different types of tax planning moves that you can have. And I think what most people fail to realize is even after you make those correct moves, right, you get the right retirement accounts, you get the right money in your taxable account, you get the right asset allocation, determining which one of the investments that you have and which one of those accounts they go into becomes really important. And this is where I think finding a good financial advisor is often a huge separator because, and I say that because when I'm reviewing a family who's potentially looking to work with us, and I'm reviewing their investment portfolio. This is like one of the biggest issues that I see. And what I mean by that is the way that we want to position this money is, is so that it's as tax efficient for you as possible. So on really simple terms, Thomas, I think you broke that down great where there's really three different buckets. You know, we have our taxable account, which we're going to pay taxes as we go. We have our tax deferred account, which is like traditional retirement accounts. And we have our tax-free accounts. Obviously, we want everything to be in tax-free accounts if that's possible, but that's not the way it works. And there's also potential downsides to that. So we're going to have money in all three of these different buckets. So then determining, okay, if this X investment is going to be producing a lot of income, which one of these accounts would be best positioned for it to be in? If this account or if this investment is going to produce a lot of capital appreciation or potential growth in the future, which one of those three accounts should it be in? If we're going to be using this investment in the next five years and we're 33 years old, which account should that be in? I think these are all questions that are kind of next level questions. You know, we do the planning, we do the tax planning, we get the right accounts open, we get the right asset allocation. Then it's determining which one of these accounts should hold which investments. Yeah. So I think asset location, one is just understanding the type of accounts. And then two is understanding what goes in each of those accounts. And I think if you look at the average person's investment portfolio, they view every single account as a different portfolio. But good investment management is all of your accounts as one portfolio. So if you said, hey, I want to have 80-20 stocks to bonds, well, you wouldn't go 80-20 in your traditional account, 80-20 in your taxable account, 80-20 in your Roth account. Why? Because it would be really inefficient. So I think the best way to break this down is let's go with types of investments and where they're best suited. And let's just start with bonds, right? So bonds are fixed income. 
They are going to pay you income on a yearly basis, depending on what you really have. And so you're going to pay tax at your income rate. And so for a lot of the clients we're working with, right, they might be paying 37% plus state. So a lot of my California clients are paying 50% on any income that comes in. And so we want to avoid that at all costs, right? If we can put that somewhere else, um, then it's going to be a lot better off because you don't have that tax drag. And so time and time again, though, I see financial advisors know this step one. And so they put bonds in people's Roth accounts. And this is the last thing that you want to do. Me personally, I'd probably even rather have bonds in a taxable account than a Roth account. And you alluded to this before, right? Like if you have a really high appreciating asset, you want it to be in Roth, right? Let's say you have the $100,000 investment, it 10Xs, it becomes worth a million dollars. If that's in a Roth account, you just got $900,000 of capital gains tax-free. If it's in a taxable account, you're going to pay capital gains on $900,000. So for the people we work with, right, that's 20% long-term capital gains, 3.8% net investment tax plus state. So this California person, 35% of $900,000, that is a huge difference of where you get to long-term. So for fixed income for me, if somebody has 80-20 and I can put all 20% of their bonds of their portfolio in pre-tax accounts, I would prefer to do that for a couple of reasons. One, you don't have the income taxes, right, as, as that income is being paid out. And two, your pre-tax accounts are the ones that you're going to pay income taxes on when you withdraw them. So you also would want the lowest appreciating assets that you have in that pre-tax account because of the income taxes. Yeah, this makes a huge difference, especially when you start looking at years of compounding. For a lot of the clients that we're working with, Thomas, like they have decades, Lord willing, in front of them to let their money continue to compound. And some of these smaller decisions that you make, like on the surface, you think, like, oh, maybe that wouldn't make that big of a difference. But to your point specifically, like if we went all equities in our Roth portion, and when I say Roth, that just simply means that that money is going to grow tax free and could come out tax free in retirement. If we went all equities there and we took any sleeve that we had of bonds and we moved that into either a tax deferred account or a taxable account, we could keep our total allocation the same. So we're not taking on any more risk than we would have been taking on if we would have kept in there. But then the benefit there is more than likely our equities are going to earn a higher rate of return over the next several decades than those bonds would have, which makes a huge difference on what the end account value is, which then in turn makes a huge difference on what our tax bill is. And that's why it goes back to like every time that we talk about tax planning, we're always thinking about it from how can we pay the lowest amount of lifetime taxes? This is a great way to try to pay the lowest amount of lifetime taxes is to understand what your asset location is. And the other thing I would say is if you're working with a, an advisor and you've never had a conversation around those three different buckets, tax-free, taxable, and tax-deferred, you really need to make sure you're having that conversation I can't tell you how many folks we've had come in and, and that's the first time they've ever heard me talk about that. And this is a really, really important thing. Like this, is, this should not be an overlook. This is not like some nuanced thing that applies only to certain people. This applies across the board. 99% of people are going to have different types of accounts. Now you might not have a bunch of money in your taxable account, like maybe a young athlete or entrepreneur would have, but you might have still a Roth account. You might still have a tax deferred account. You are going to have a taxable account. I mean, it could just be your checking account. That's a taxable account. So this is a yeah. really important thing. And I just, I don't want you to glaze over this thinking like this is some nuanced thing that only applies to certain people in certain situations. This applies to everybody across the board. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think your point on the compounding is really important because you're right. It might not feel that big of a deal to use Roth versus taxable in a one or two year period of time, but 40 to 50 years, you know, it, it really is. But let's continue on with kind of where some of the, some assets fit best, right? So we got that one. Um, the other one, uh, fixed income, kind of in the same boat as anything that's going to pay a lot of dividends, right? Especially, you know, non-qualified, that could be REITs. And so if you have REITs, again, you're probably going to want to have those type of investments in some tax deferred or tax-free account. REITs have higher expected returns typically than bonds. So that might be one that it's okay to put in a Roth account. But again, a pre-tax account might also be a really good place. Then we go to taxable, right? So your individual stocks are probably going to be in taxable or Roth because of growth. Um, you also want really tax efficient. So ETFs over mutual funds a lot of times make way more sense in a taxable account. But again, a taxable account, when you can avoid fixed income, you want to. But again, obviously, like, hey, if you're going to retire early and you need to 
fill up and you know have income for the first few years, you might need to use taxable accounts or if you have short, certain short-term goals. But other than that, you really want stocks, you want um, ETFs that are gonna hold the, the income inside of them. You really just wanna focus on assets that are gonna grow and not spit out a, a bunch of income. And then the last one's Roth, and I'll kind of put HSA in that same bucket. Really here, you just want your highest appreciating assets. It doesn't really matter if they have dividends, if they have income, because that's all going to be shielded. You're not going to pay those taxes. But in general, you only have so much room to get money into Roth on a yearly basis, You know, even through Roth conversions, et cetera. Those high appreciating assets, you want to put there. But I will caveat this and say sometimes people put in their highest risk assets there because they're like, hey... I own a bunch of a small cryptocurrency. I think that could 10X otherwise, what or 100X, why would I invest in it? Well, you're also putting a really big risk to have your Roth dollars go to zero by putting in assets that could amount to nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's really important for people to understand. You, you made a good point on the taxable account specifically. So I want to dive a little deeper into that because for... For the clients I'm working with, the large majority of their total net worth of their investment portfolio is typically in their taxable account. And that's for the simple reason that we can only allocate a certain amount of money towards Roth in traditional retirement accounts in any given year. It's really important when you're investing in a taxable account that you understand that you're going to be paying taxes as you go. So typically the, the two forms of taxes you're going to pay is just going to be taxes from the income that you're making. So those are going to be things like the dividends that you have or potentially the yields that you're getting from the bonds that you have. The second area that you're going to have is you're going to have some sort of capital gains distribution at the end of the year if you own things like mutual funds. Thomas, you mentioned the difference between ETFs and mutual funds. I think this is a really important thing for people to understand. An ETF and a mutual fund act essentially the same way. Think about them like a basket of stocks. But at the end of the year, typically mutual funds will distribute some of those gains to you. So what that actually means for you in your real life is you're going to be paying taxes on that distribution to you. Whether you want to take the money out or not, they're actually sending you some money, they're lowering your cost basis, and then you're paying tax on it. That makes a huge difference on what your after-tax rate of return is going to be. The other thing that I want to make a point of is if you're in some sort of investment strategy where there's a lot of trading going on, this is not something that we are typically doing with our clients. But if you are in some sort of investment strategy where there's a lot of trading going on, you need to make sure that you're cognizant that if it's in a taxable account, every time that advisor buys and sells or you buy and sell positions, if they're at gains, you're going to be paying taxes as you go. And the reason why I want to make this as it's such an important point, we often look at like total return, like what is my return? What you really care about is what is your after tax rate of return? And this is true for any of these accounts, right? Like Thomas, you mentioned the Roth account. If we can have more appreciation in that account, that means our after-tax rate of return is going to be higher because we're not going to pay any taxes on it when we take it out. So I just think this is such an important point, something that I see time and time again and mistakes that have been made for clients I've seen come in. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree anymore. And I think we probably hit on everything that we need to hit on on this topic. I don't think we're going to go into you know when to contribute to Roth versus not or when to contribute to traditional. I think at the end of the day, what this was all about is that asset location matters. What investments you put in a different in different um, account types matters, and you want to view your entire portfolio holistically. This can be a huge difference of where you end up in the long run is, is when you really nail asset allocation and asset location. The one thing I haven't hit on that I do want to hit on is a lot of people like investing. A lot of people have an itch to invest in individual stocks, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. If that is you. Carve out a part of your portfolio to do that, a part that you're not going to be held back if you don't hit it. For some people, it's 20%. For some people, it's 5%. But as you build up your portfolio, I've seen way too many people not do this, and then they use their big main accounts to do it, and their investment portfolio and their investment returns are terrible because they're messing with too much money. Just carve out a small part, invest in some of the things that you believe on, believe in. If it grows and does really well, that's amazing. And if it doesn't, at least you set yourself up in a way that it's not really going to hold you back. But we appreciate everybody. We appreciate you guys all uh, for listening. Again, uh, you know, we we love doing this podcast. I actually, for the first time recently, had a prospect come from the podcast, so that felt really good. But if you guys enjoy this, please rate, please subscribe, please share with your friends. And if you have any topics that you want us to go over, both of our DMs are open on Twitter. We'll take the feedback. We'll do episodes on the topics that are relevant to you. Um, but until then, 
See you guys next week.